running Kubernetes clusters on shared infrastructure often come with a lot of trade-offs. There are noisy neighbors, limited isolation, and of course, operational complexities. And the fact is that enterprises want stronger tenants models without giving up on Kubernetes agility. What if you could run fully isolated virtual clusters with their own control planes directly on VMs or bare metal without depending on a host cluster. That's what vCluster Labs is delivering with vCluster standalone. And today we have with us once again, Lucas Gently, CEO of vCluster Labs to unpack what this means for Kubernetes tenancy. Lucas, great to have you back on the show. Yeah, good to be back again so quickly. I know there's a lot to announce this year. It's my pleasure, uh, Lucas, we have been covering vCluster Labs when it was Loft Lab from the very beginning. And I've been noticing that you are pushing the boundaries of Kubernetes tenancy with vCluster, whether it's private nodes or auto scaling. And now we have vCluster standalone. Can you walk us through what it is and how it extend that evolution of vCluster that we have been witnessing? I mean, when we launched vCluster, we really started running vCluster on top of an existing Kubernetes cluster, whether that's like EKS or Rancher cluster, what, whatever the customer is already using. There are so many people out in the Kubernetes community that have existing clusters and wanted a, a better way to segregate them, split them up, have that multi-tenant experience on top of a, of a shared cluster. That's really what, what vCluster was, was solving. And I, I think it has solved it today. Uh, multi-tenancy got a lot easier with the V cluster. But on the node level, there have still been issues, right? You still had workloads sharing the same nodes. So we introduced things like private nodes. Uh, we obviously have the way to, you know, to dedicated nodes with node selectors. And we also introduced, um, you know, private nodes completely to, to segregate things and create fully, you know, single tenant clusters while still having that control plane cluster that, that hosts your vCluster pods. However, if you want to run vCluster in a completely new estate, right? So Greenfield, if you're saying, okay, I, I am buying one of these NVIDIA supercomputers, I'm building you know, a GPU estate and you don't have one right now in your private cloud. A lot of folks are looking towards vCluster as a solution for these kind of architectures and they need an existing cluster. So they're asking us, why do I need to now spin up a K3S cluster or K0S cluster or a Ranger cluster in order to get started? Can she bootstrap that initial cluster in order to launch the first couple of V clusters for my tenants? Can she bootstrap that based on, you know, VMs or bare metal machines? Can I just install this like K3S directly on the machine without any underlying Kubernetes cluster required? That's really what we're doing with uh, with vCluster standalone. You can literally like K3S, you run a single command, and that means you have a single node cluster now. Control plane is set up. Then you can add additional control plane nodes in order to make it HA. And then obviously you can or you can add worker nodes either manually or via auto nodes, a feature of vCluster platform to provision you know these worker nodes in EC2 or you know, GCP or Azure, but also in your private cloud. Um, so it really becomes this bootstrap cluster. The cluster one uh, problem is that we're solving here because we, we believe we, we don't want to be another, you know, like K3S or, or something like that. We really just want to be that cluster that can be bootstrapped in order to launch the cluster control planes on top of that. Because inherently we believe running, you know, the cluster control planes as pods is the best way to operate a Kubernetes cluster. But you still need that one cluster to get started with. And that's what vCluster standalone helps you create pretty quickly. As we all know, traditional vCluster runs inside a host Kubernetes cluster's namespace, whereas a standalone breaks away from that dependency. What does this shift unlocks in terms of isolation and flexibility? Yeah, I think that the biggest part really is around having that initial cluster set up and supported 
by the same team and the same company and the same technology that you also use in order to run your multi-tenant clusters or your clusters running as pods. So if somebody has problems with the underlying host cluster that runs your vClusters, if that cluster is an OpenShift cluster, there's not much our team can do to help you, right? Like maybe we can, you know, be a sparing partner in order to get to the root cause, but if you actually want an SLA and support, you got to turn to Red Hat because we have no control over, you know, how OpenShift is set up. Same for Rancher, the same for EKS. But if you have a new estate, especially in your private cloud, and your goal is ultimately to run vCluster as the central component, vCluster is really the technology to spin up the clusters for your tenants, then your host cluster can now also be vCluster. That gives you a lot of flexibility and it makes you you know, much more independent of any other vendor because you can get an out of the box solution. You know, it's kind of like V clusters all the way down. Um, that's effectively what we, uh, what we offer with, with V cluster standalone. You have been working with partners, beta testers. Where do you see the strongest use case for V cluster standalone? And when should organizations consider replacing host clusters with this model? I generally would say if you're in a public cloud today and you're using one of the big hyperscalers managed offering, you're in a good place. I would never tell you, hey, re you know, replace complete EKS with, um, with vCluster standalone directly running on EC2 nodes managed completely by yourself. Why would you? EKS is a great solution for you. Um, it's highly integrated with, with your cloud platform. But if you're in, maybe a, a regional cloud provider, maybe a neo cloud, maybe they don't have a Kubernetes offering at all. They only have a VM or a bare metal offering where you get the pure, you know, servers and credentials to these machines. And you want to bootstrap, you know, your own EKS like experience. Same counts for your private cloud. Same counts for, you know, these AI supercomputers that you, you might be building in, you know, your bare metal data centers. Um, there, in order to get started with this EKS like feeling that vCluster offers, you need that initial cluster to bootstrap everything. And vCluster standalone is a great solution for that. So it's less of a, you know, replace existing clusters with this and more of a, you know, if I'm in environments where I don't have a cluster that is very well supported in order to run my vClusters, this is a great option for you. For customers, the question is always about the business value they get from a technology. How does vCluster standalone reduce complexity, cost, or risk compared to existing tenancy options? And what kind of support can they expect from vCluster Labs? Yeah, of course, all the all the support we provide for vCluster in general, when you run it in production, our SLAs, our 24-7 support, all of that is available to standalone uh, as well. And I would say, you know, standalone is a, is a really interesting step for us because, you know, in a way it is kind of going back in time because this is the original design of a Kubernetes cluster, right? You run a couple of control plane nodes on VMs or on bare metal machines as processes, not as, not as containers, not containerized. That, that is the OG Kubernetes cluster. If you remember Kelsey Hightower's Kubernetes the hard way, right? That's how it is setting it up, directly spin out the control plane uh, nodes and then add the worker nodes to it. Very, very traditional Kubernetes, which is not what we have been doing. We've been reinventing Kubernetes for the past couple of years. And in some ways, vCluster standalone now goes back to the roots. And again, not to repeat here, but we really don't encourage people to go back full blown to this legacy model, but we're saying, if you have that, you know, cluster one problem where you're saying I have zero clusters today and I need to spin up my first cluster, vCluster standalone is a great option there, especially if you want the same level of, you know, support and involvement from our team and the makers of the really important component of your Kubernetes stack, which, you know, is vCluster for a lot of these users. Now let's talk about one of the hottest topic these days, AI. We have seen a growing demand for GPU workloads in AI and ML. Is vCluster standalone especially well suited for GPU use cases? I would say vCluster in general is a great solution for GPU workloads. We're investing very, very heavily in making vCluster 
the best Kubernetes offering for GPUs. If you want to, you know, share your GPU servers and your GPU estate, you can look at vCluster and also vNode as a very, very solid solution stack. Um, but again, you got to start somewhere. And if you are in the private cloud on something like an NVIDIA SuperPod, for example, right? One of these like supercomputers out of a box, right? That roll into your data center rack by rack, right? The question is, how do I bootstrap a cluster there? vCluster standalone is the starting point. And then, you know, regular vClusters with private nodes running as containers on top, consuming these GPU uh, nodes and dynamically reallocating them with auto nodes. That's a really great mechanism to say, hey, I have like five business units or eight different machine learning teams that need to share this GPU estate. And we can give you pretty much from zero to the entire multi-tenant solution on top of an AI factory or an AI supercomputer we can deliver an entire solution to you, including, you know, all the bells and whistles around how to isolate the network, how to pixie boot the nodes. I think that is very, very compelling for a lot of folks building these, you know, it's, it's greenfield IT pretty much, right? Uh, these environments, these, these, you know, GPU clouds, these GPU uh, environments at, at large enterprises, they are just being built out. It's a very, very exciting time. And, and it's really exciting, quite frankly, to be, part of that evolution and, and part of this journey for, for a lot of our customers. Have you already seen customers using vCluster standalone or vCluster for AI training or inference workloads? And if yes, what kinds of patterns are emerging there? Uh, we've seen vCluster used for it. Uh, vCluster standalone, again, right now, the prime function is to run other vClusters on top. And then you use those vClusters to connect to your GPUs and run the GPU operator and run training inference workloads on top of that. It's not necessarily that we would say run it directly on vCluster standalone. Nothing preventing you from necessarily doing it, but vCluster standalone, just like a traditional uh, Kubernetes cluster, is a relatively static cluster versus when you run five vClusters now on top of your vCluster standalone, that's where you get that dynamic scheduling and dynamic assignment of nodes, right? Um, and I think that's that's the flexibility that a lot of enterprises are looking for. What is this large signal for the broader future of Kubernetes tenancy? Do you see a world where virtual clusters will replace most host clusters entirely? Yeah, I, I think it will definitely be a, a heterogeneous world. I, I don't think there is a... There's the one Kubernetes distro to run everything everywhere, right? There's so many different scenarios like edge deployments, public clouds with the hyperscalers, regional cloud providers, you know, vSphere based estates, KubeWord based estates. Um, then you have bare metal clouds, you have the neo clouds, right? It's so such a big variety of, of options. I think will play a significant role for a lot of customers who look at flexible tenancy models across the board. So they don't just have one specific use case, they often have multiple use cases. Let's say they need very lightweight and quick and cheap clusters for you know, ephemeral CI pipelines, for development, for staging. And then they also need you know, more resilient and isolated workloads for AI inference on their GPU private cloud. And then they might need to run vendor software in a secure fashion in a multi-tenant way in the public cloud, right? Folks that have all of these different use cases and a combination of things, they're super well suited to use vCluster given that we cover this entire spectrum. And you it's kind of like Terraform when you think about it, right? You could use cloud formation directly in AWS, or maybe 10 years ago you bet on Terraform and said, let me abstract from the cloud provider and buy into a language and a definition that I can use across GCP, Azure, AWS, right? And have this common language. And in some ways, the vCluster YAML is also that common language for these different, you know, tenancy models and facets of multi-tenancy and, and tenancy in general for Kubernetes. I think that's what we aspire to be. Um, but I wouldn't say, you know, 
the future of Kubernetes is vCosta only. I, I definitely think it's it's going to be much more heterogeneous than that. Can you talk about what does the deployment model looks like for vCluster standalone? How easy is it for teams to get started on bare metal or VMs if they are coming from a traditional Kubernetes setup? And how involved vCluster Labs team get to help them with this journey? Of course, we can be as involved or as hands-off as somebody prefers, but you know, as Swapnil, we care a lot about initial user experience and we try to make it as easy as possible to get going. So I would say standing up vCluster standalone is as easy as spinning up a K3S or a K0S cluster, right? Like you run a single command and you know, it curls a script on your machine, it executes it, it takes care of installing all of the necessary tooling, right, like container D, et cetera, making sure your machine is equipped and then deploys vCluster standalone. There's a vCluster YAML um, in your configuration files on that machine. You can easily update that, restart the service, right, um, to upgrade the Kubernetes version, upgrade the vCluster version. It's really, really easy. Single command, uh, one line to, to get going. And then I guess two more lines in order to make it HA. Um, and then you can connect it to because the platform to even get worker nodes automatically. So as smooth as possible. But of course, you know, a lot of our customers are, are large enterprises and, and have very complex deployments. And I would say the actual execution of this is easy. But the planning of what is the right architecture, what is the right tenancy model for a particular use case, a lot of them want to have like these architecture deep dives of our team to really map it out, draw an architecture diagram and see how can we set up, you know, this vCluster uh, platform and the individual vClusters plus vCluster standalone. How can we set it up in the most efficient way? How do we bootstrap it? How do we do day two operations? Um, there's obviously a lot of folks that reach out to us for, for these kind of discussions up front before they kick the tires. And maybe it's easy to kick the tires on, on your local laptop to play around with it. But as soon as it gets to your, you know, bare metal cluster, your AI factory, or even your public cloud estate, uh, you might want to check in with us and, and have a chat of, you know, how does this work for UK, for your case? We've seen it obviously across the board with small organizations, with high growth startups, with large enterprises. I think we've pretty much seen everything at this point. So we can be very, very helpful in, in terms of architecting the right solution for a particular customer. Many organizations already run hybrid environments. How does vCluster standalone integrate with existing infrastructure? Can customers mix and match with vCluster running inside host clusters? No, it's pretty flexible. I mean, you can obviously uh, choose a different host cluster, but if you are using standalone, generally you would run it in the same environment. Um, but you could technically say, hey, I'm spinning up a standalone cluster with a node from AWS and a node from my private cloud. But you'll have to consider obviously things like network traffic, latency, egress fees. Right? There's a lot of considerations that, that play into these hybrid uh, Kubernetes cluster scenarios. And there's a reason why, you know, the, the cloud providers and even the hyperscalers don't really offer, you know, uh, cross regional or hybrid cloud, uh, clusters for a lot of scenarios. I think regarding the worker nodes, not when we're not talking about the control plane nodes, that is absolutely possible. One of the value propositions we have with auto nodes and, and, you know, private nodes in general is that you can join nodes from pretty much anywhere. And we actually also securely, uh, create a VPN under the hood to allow pot to pot traffic in a secure way, even in hybrid scenarios. And that same mechanism can be used for standalone V clusters as well. Lucas, it's quite clear that whether it's isolation, flexibility, or GPU ready performance, V cluster standalone is shaping a new chapter in Kubernetes tenancy. I really appreciate your time today for joining us and breaking it down for us. Thank you, and I look forward to chatting with you again. Absolutely. I'll see you at KubeCon in Atlanta. And to our audience, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe, and stay tuned for more conversations here on TFIRE.